Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I mean, my mind is going 100 miles an hour, you know, yes. trying to absorb all this stuff and react to it. Let's go right into the panel. Uh, let me give you the rules of the game so we can have as much interchange uh, as possible between us and the speakers. We are going to go uh, in the order that you have in your program. I'm not going to take time uh, to introduce everyone. Uh, you have their information. I do want to recognize uh, Glenn, who was co one of the uh, co-founder. Uh, where's Andy? Hi. Andy's back there too. Welcome. Delighted. So with that, I'm going to give each of the speakers 10 minutes. Then we'll go to uh, question and answers, OK? Dr. Arcel, my dear colleague. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for, for being here. Um, I would just like to sort of bring attention to what we have been doing over this weekend and, and thank to, to Olga and all the people that have worked so hard so you can just imagine what, what has happened. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and <coughs> Sunday. We have spent four days meeting with a, gr a group of about 18 recently arrived Cuban dissidents. These are young or not so young brave men and women that have fought the regime. One of them was uh, 17 years in prison. Uh, another one was a member of the group of 75. And we realized that they didn't have any idea what, how a democracy works, what a market economy is. So we have immersed them in four days with the help, obviously, of, of all of the people that, that you see here. And imagine for a minute their reactions. I was sort of trying to watch their faces when we talked about <coughs> John Locke, Hayek, Bastiat, Milton Friedman. They had never heard of any of these things. It was really, really enlightening for them to hear about, about these ideas. <coughs> Individual rights versus collective rights. Freedom to uh, as different from freedom from, some of the concepts that are all part of, of this uh, uh, <coughs> ideas of freedom. Jaroslav, by the way, he, uh, I don't think Andy mentioned it, uh, was the person that translated Atlas Shrug into Russian. Oh, here. Huh? Mm. Oh, Glenn. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry about that. Actually, I didn't translate it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't translate it. I, I was the project so, manager. <laughs> so, the, the book is, is available in, in Russian. But imagine. Uh, these ideas for, for these people that we've been trying to talk to, the idea that capitalism is the most moral system that we know. This was like, you know, you, you were talking to, to uh, they had never heard any, any of these things. But one point, that, and I'm going to be very brief, that I want to sort of uh, leave you with. Actually, two, two points. <coughs> one is, and I came across this peculiarity when uh, I wrote my book, uh, Manana in Cuba, and I talked about freedom and uh, liberty. When I went to translate the book, and I mean the process of that, I realized a very peculiar thing. I had never thought about it. The word freedom does not exist in Spanish. There is no word for freedom in Spanish, only liberty. So when I was trying to make the distinction, I had to say, well, I mean freedom when I have a capitalized, and I mean liberty when I have low, lower case. When we were talking to this uh, Cuban group, the idea was to obviously explain the difference between freedom to, and that <coughs> real freedom is freedom from oppression. <coughs> you don't need a government to tell you that you're now free to travel or that you're now free to listen to whatever music you want to listen to, those are freedoms that you have. All you need is one freedom. You want to be freedom from oppression. So it was interesting to be able to, uh, <coughs> to convey that idea, philosophical idea, to, to this particular group of people. And, and the other peculiarity that I just want, and maybe some of you guys can help me uh, think a little bit about this, I shared this with, with Olga and with Raul recently. Uh, one of the things that freedom requires, absolutely requires, is that we accept responsibility for our actions. Absolutely. 
freedom means we are free to act as we want to act, but we have to accept responsibilities for our action. I was uh, vacationing in Montana, and I was reading Carlos Seyde's book, uh, Learning to Die in Miami, and there was a section there, he said, Pedro Pan, like I am, that sort of got me thinking. Carlos, in his book, notes that when he's beginning to learn English, he becomes aware that English assigns to himself a responsibility that Spanish does not. And he makes the note that in Spanish we use reflexive verbs. He gives the example that as a young boy, if he's going to school and he drops a book, we say, se me cayó el libro. No fui yo el que lo dejé caer. It was gravity's fault. <laughs> in English, we say, I drop the book. I assume responsibility. Se me perdieron las llaves. I lost the keys, in English. And linguistically, I've been thinking about this quite a bit because <coughs> it is something that perhaps culturally begins to explain why it is that we do not accept responsibility. And it's not just in Cuba, it's in Latin America. Uh, Dominican Republic has written 37 constitutions. <coughs> uh, I think Venezuela is at number 24. The United States has written basically one and some amendments. And that's about. But how do we learn to present <coughs> these ideas of individual freedom, of individual responsibility, not only to, to that Cuba of the future, but to the Latin community. How do we introduce the concepts of individual freedoms and individual responsibility to a population that perhaps is culturally biased, maybe because of language, maybe because vamos a la culpa los españoles, we have not developed that kind of personal responsibility. So I wanted to sort of leave you guys with that, with that idea, and I didn't want to take any more time, Andy. No, no, you actually gave me two minutes back, so I'll give it to you later. OK. 